Come on, this is the house of God. We don't have to stop. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah. Father, we bless your name. Lord God, even as we transition into your word, Father, we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord God, that you would uh, touch your people, answer, Lord God, prayers, bring, can bring peace to chaos. Father God, bring healing, Lord God, to sickness. Bring order to disorder. Father, your word has the power to do that. Father, we thank you for a changing of lives today. Father, not because this, your servant is special, Lord God, but because your word has the power it takes to change a life. Father, we thank you. Father, I pray for these people, Lord God, that they would not just hear from your servant, Lord God, but they would indeed hear from you. Lord God, we hear from men and women all week long. And we've come to your house, Lord God, to hear a word from you, Lord God to find help in the time of trouble. Father, so we thank you, Lord God, and we trust, Lord God, that you would come through for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. That was good if it was for me. But if this is Bethel, the house of God, I don't know if that's good enough for God. I'm not sure if that was good enough for God. See, I haven't done anything for you, so it's okay to pat your hands like that. But God woke us up this morning. God has given us a reasonable portion of health and strength. It is God that has made a way out of no way. And it is the God, that same God that we depend on today to take us through today and into tomorrow. So because he's that kind of God, we need to give him that kind of praise. Listen, I'd like to bring, uh, bring, like I'm in another place. I'd like to thank Bishop Caesar and Pastor Bev for allowing, uh, allowing me to speak today. Um, if you guys know me, you know you won't be here long. <laughs> Unless the Lord does something unusual, all right? So stay with me. Don't go to the store. Stay with me for a little while. Because if you go to the store and come back, we'll be going. I tr trust me. <laughs> Listen, I, I'd like to also thank my lovely wife. Uh, I don't even know what to call you right now. I'm going to call you, because we call you a lot of things. I, we call each other a lot of things. Good things. Good things. Good things. But I'm going to call up by her first name, my wonderful wife, Letitia Towles. Put your hands together. And I want to get some preliminary things out of the way before we jump in. Is that okay? All right. First thing. How many people here have a teenager that's in junior high school or high school? Just raise your hand. Junior high school or high school? Beautiful. Here's the thing. Um, at 11.15 on most Sundays, except for fifth Sunday, we have something called Joppa, right? Everybody here has ever been through Joppa, make some noise. They're tired. Okay. Let's try one more. I didn't prep them. Everybody that has ever gone to or been through Joppa at some point, make some noise. That's a little better. They, they do say this is the young side of the church. So I figured it was going to come from over here. It's cool. All right. Here's, here's the thing. If you, have a, if you have a kid in high school or junior high school, right, at 11.15 every Sunday morning except for fifth Sunday or unless there's some kind of special service, we have something called Joppa. Joppa, and this sounds like a commercial, is the youth church of Bethel Gospel Tabernacle, right? We take what you guys do here, flip it so it's... Let me make sure I say this the right way. Flip it to make sure it's presentable to kids, right? So it has to be a little element of fun. It's a little edgy, right? Yeah, yeah. But it's presentable in a way that they understand that the same thing you do, that the gospel of Jesus Christ changes lives. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So now, here's how I need your, here's what, here's what we need. We need your participation. If you have a kid, a child, a young person, a youth in junior high school or high school, you should send them across the street. 
I know parenting is different these days. See, we didn't have choices about going to church. My, mom's, my mom said, when my key turns and locks the door here, when I go to church, you go to church. Now, you do have a choice. You have a choice. If you don't want to go to church, when my key locks this door, you can take everything that somebody say you own and find someplace else to stay. Right? So we didn't have choices. I know parents today have choice. They give kids choices. They say, well, you know what, Johnny, if you want to go to church, but when they say, when it comes Monday through Friday, they don't say, well, Johnny, if you want to go to school, no, you better go to school. But we give them a choice if they come to church or not. I'll have to come back and talk about that another time. 11.15, 11.15 Sunday morning, Joppa service. Second thing is this. Some, just some stuff. Trust me, I told you I won't be before you long. So I think if I could take another two minutes, this will work. Also, at the end of the service, I'm going to be across the street. I have some books, and I'm going to explain why. I'm very uncomfortable doing this in church, but I'm going to do it anyway. Because um, I, I told the bishop, he said it was okay. All right. Um, what we do with these books, I wrote these books. What we do with these books, my wife and I, we run a nonprofit organization that helps young people. Right? It helps them with um, college tuition in form of scholarships for books, right? And it also teaches them about entrepreneurship and finance. So what we do to help finance that is we sell books. So some of the books that we, the books that we sell, a portion of those proceeds go to this nonprofit organization so we can help fund somebody's education, Amen. at least help fund somebody's education, right? Amen. Amen. And we've done a few young people here and a few young people in other states as well, and we help them. We're not special, we just need to help. Right? If one person helps, it makes a difference, right? We're two people that are just trying to help. So really quick, there's a book on leadership called Leadership Under 30, right? There's a book called Project Debt Free if you're in debt and want to work out. This is it. There's a book on tithing and stewardship. And there's the Walk Through Proverbs, which is, which is a devotional through the book of Proverbs. I'll be across the street at the end of the service. Well, like I said, when you purchase one of these books, you help somebody, right? You help somebody. So that's all we want you to do. We want you to help us help somebody. Does that make sense? All right. Let's jump into the word. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. The topic today or the subject today is simply there are others. Yes, please repeat that. There are others. Our culture has conditioned us to be self-centered. We're very self-centered as a people. Not just African-American people, but people in general. We're very self-centered. In an attempt to boost um, the self-esteem of many, we've told them that nobody does it like you. Right? And albeit that that's true, to some degree, we should also inform them that although there's nobody that can do it like you, there are people that are going to do what you do. Make sense? Right? We teach children to be the best. We should be teaching them to do their best. It's very different. It sounds the same, but it's different. When you teach a child to be, their, be the best, that puts him or her at odds with somebody else like them. But when you teach them to be their best or to be at their best, right? then it leaves space for other people to do what they do. How does that manifest in church? Well, in church, here's how, here's how it works. I've been in church for a very long time. I've seen a very good amount of things, right? Not here, because, you know, we got it all going. We got it together. That was a joke. Work with me. All right. <laughs> tough worship crowd and tough, tough comedy crowd, too. It's all right. So we teach people, again, we teach the children how we teach children to be, the, to be the best, but not to be at their best. So what happens when it comes to church is this. We come to church and we engage in ministry, right? And once somebody sings better than us, all of a sudden we get a little depressed. And we want to quit. Because we weren't taught that we're not supposed to be the best. We're just supposed to be at our best. Here's how that works out in church. Well, if, some, if you're a preacher and somebody gets up and they got the house on fire, everybody's up. And you're just talking and everybody's sitting there like. 
One might compare one to another and say, well, you know what? I'm not as good as him or her. But again, we, we're not supposed to be the best. We're supposed to be at our best. It even works out the same way in the church in large, right? We're a church in the middle of South Jamaica, right? And sometimes the, the membership says, I go to the best church in the world. And that's good that you are behind your church like that. But we're not the only church in South Jamaica. We're not even the only church on this block, right? So we can't be the best because that would say that we're better than Calvary. We're better than rescue. And everybody keep your opinions to yourself, right? But we are supposed to be at our best. Does that make sense? Believers, sometimes what ends up happening, we have, to, unless a believer has a title or gets their name called, many times they decline to engage in the church's activity, the mission of the church to reach the lost. But you don't need a title. And if you do need a title, everybody was given one at birth. It was either Mr. or Miss. There's your title. Let's get to work. Luke chapter 9, verse 46. There are others. The Bible reads, and I'm reading from the um, NIV. It says, verse 46, an argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Sounds familiar. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, whoever welcomes this, this little child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is least among you all who is the greatest. Master, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him. But because he is not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for whoever is not against you is for you. After this, and then I'm going to drop down to... Um, flip over to Luke chapter 10 verse 1 and it says Luke chapter 10 verse 1 after this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to each excuse me to every town and place where he was about to go just look up for a second the first the first point is this is that there are other people that are doing God's will you're not the only one that's doing God's will it is, a, it is self-deception for you to believe that I am the only one doing God's will. We've written songs. I'm going up the rough side of the mountain as if you are the only one on God's green earth that is doing God's will. How self-righteous of us that we're the only ones. The disciples had the same problem. They're trying to figure out well, wait a minute. Jesus, because if you, if you check Luke chapter 9, the beginning of Luke chapter 9, you see that Jesus gives power and authority to the 12 to cast out demons and to drive out sickness, right? Shortly thereafter, Luke records in the same chapter, he records that Jesus fed the multitudes with five loaves and two fish. Everybody remember that story, right? So they've seen all of this, right? Then they took some, after having only five loads and two fish, right, feeding over 5,000 people, they have 12 baskets left over. So they saw a miracle. Shortly thereafter, it is when, it is when Jesus gets his disciples together, and he says, who do men say I am? And, Paul, and Peter comes out and says, thou art the Christ, right? The Bible records, or Luke records in the Bible, he says about eight days later, about, somebody say eight days. A little over a week later, he takes them to the Mount of Transfig uh, Configuration, right? And they begin to see these two images that Jesus is talking to, right? The next, the very next day, they hear God's voice from heaven stating that this is my son and who I am well pleased. Track with me. You've driven out, you've driven out demons and sickness and disease, Right? You've seen 5,000 people get fed and have with, with five loaves of bread and two fish and still have stuff left over, 12 baskets left over, right? You've seen something miraculous happen at the Mount of Transfiguration 
And now you have this revelation that this is the Christ. All within about, let's say about a month's time, right? You've seen all of this. Then we go one step further. Then we see the disciples, a young man, a, 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 excuse me, a father bring a young man to the disciples. And the disciples begin to pray for this young man. But this demon won't come out. And Jesus cast out this unclean spirit. Now, after the height of driving out demons and driving out sickness, seeing 5,000 people get fed with little or nothing, no resource, right? Having this awesome revelation that this is the, this is the Christ. This is the dude that we've been talking about since the Old Testament. This is him, yeah. right? After seeing the, Mount of, the stuff that happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, and also failing at a task to now rebuke a similar demon to the ones you were rebuking earlier, you would think the last thing that the disciples would try to figure out is, yo, when Jesus leaves, who's going to be in charge? You would be trying to take a tutorial on casting out demons. Because last week when I did this, it left. Now this week I did this and it just, it got irritated. It might have gotten worse. So the last thing I would have thought about doing was trying to figure out who's going to take over the show when Jesus is gone. But that shows where our mind is. That shows where our hearts can be at times. Even when we've seen and experienced the power of God, our minds and our hearts can still be in a far self-centered. Somebody say self-centered. Self-centered place. Because I want to be great I want to be great I want to be great verse 50 he says the disciple the disciples say you know what now everything's out on the table now because now Jesus knew their hearts and they understood now that Jesus knew their hearts so John comes forward he says you know what I gotta tell you something a little while ago we saw a guy casting out demons just like you did they were doing, he was doing the same thing you told us to do. But we stopped, we tried to stop him, right? And Jesus says, what are you stopping him for? If he's not against you, then he's for you, right? So but the, here's, here's another, somebody say self-centered. Here's another self-centered moment. The disciples in their minds, they're saying, well, listen, there's only 12 of us. He only empowered 12 of us. This dude wasn't here. Who was he? How many of you have ever been a part of an exclusive group and then somebody new comes and you're like, the brothers do, who is this dude? The ladies just look you up and down like, write this down. If, you, if, you're, if you're taking notes, write this down. Anytime there's an abuse or misunderstanding of power, people will be prevented from get, being delivered. The disciples misunderstood what they had. They knew they had power, but they weren't responsible enough to use that power the correct way. Here's what I mean. When they saw somebody else that wasn't in that circle do what they did, it's human to say, where'd you learn that? Well, is there another Jesus? Peter just said that this dude was the Christ. Is there somebody else? We've been with him all week. You have never been around. What's going on? Right? Church, what, what, does this sound familiar? I've been here for 15 years. Oh, where you come from? <laughs> Honey, you better stay in line. You got to get in line. Like this is a union job and there's seniority. <laughs> we have a union rep that says, listen, you, there's no way he could be doing that now because he just walked in the door and got saved yesterday. He can't be doing this now. Well, she's been here for 15 years and she's not doing anything. Well, that could be a problem with her. Maybe he's willing and ready and she's stale and stink. Possible. Possible. First Kings chapter, first Kings chapter 19. No, excuse me, excuse me. First Kings chapter 19, you read that at home. I don't want to take that much time. It's to, it tells the story of Elijah, right? He has the same complex. Elijah comes down. He's done his thing for God, done something wonderful for God. And he says, he gets a letter from Jezebel. And he says, oh, my God. 
Now, God, what are you going to do when she kills me? I'm the only one here. God is like, look, anoint this person, anoint that person, anoint this person. And by the way, there's 7,000 people that you don't know anything about that haven't bowed their knee to bail. Somebody say, I am not the only one. Hebrews chapter 12. Turn with me. Hebrews chapter 12, point two. We're not the only ones. There are other people. Our theology has taught us that we're the only ones. You might be the only one in your house. You might be the only one in your neighborhood, but you're not the only If God was just dependent on you, no, no, I'm going to take that back. I'm going to take that back because I don't want to offend anybody. Don't come see me after service. Only see me to buy a book. Don't come see me for nothing else. If God had depended on me only, the world would have been in trouble. Trouble. Because guess what? I have good days and I have bad days. I have days when I love people. Let me me say that right. I have days when I like and love people and there's days when I just love them. I really don't like you right now. I don't want to be bothered. Let's just be, let's just be honest. There's days that I want to be bothered. Some day, thank you, sir. There's some days you just don't want to be bothered. You see them coming and you're saying, And see, I'm going I'm to be, I'm, I'm be 100% honest. It was easy before I became clergy. See, because when I saw you coming, I'd just be like, oh. I can't quite do that now. So now when I see you coming, I'm like. No, that's way before. That's when I see you. When I, that's when I'm face to face. When I see you coming, I'm like, oh, God. Father, touch your servant now. I need strength. I'm not even sure what you're going to tell me. I just need, sometimes it's written all over their face. She's like, give me strength. I'm not sure what this is. Had a bad day. Then you start confession. Father, forgive me for anything that I've done. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Please forgive me. Because I don't want to be like the disciples and lay hands on something and it doesn't move. Right? So you, you understand the protocol. You understand that, whoa, I got to be clean. And I, uh, this is just a little different. I'm going to be 100% honest. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd, cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with pres- uh, perseverance the race marked out for us. Right? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 summarizes the previous chapter, chapter 11. Chapter 11, we, talk, we see a list of men and women of faith. And we see the stuff that they had to go through. Some were tortured, according to Hebrews chapter 11. Some were mocked. Some were stoned. Some were sawn in two. Right? We don't talk about that at church. We don't talk about that. It's in the Bible. Jesus talked about it. But it's, it's, it's the scriptures. It's the word. They were tortured. They were stoned. They were mocked, and some were sawn in two. One translation says they talked about, the, if, if, you, if you take a peek at some of the Roman tactics for discipline, they would put a person in the middle of the street, tie a rope to their arms, tie a rope to their feet, connect it to a horse on one end, a horse in the other, and hit the horse in the back with something hard. Boom! So both horses would go this way. And you know what would happen? You'd get physically pulled apart that's the kind of stuff that the believers of the first church had to go through and history has a habit of repeating itself so these are the things that we have to be prepared i'm not here to scare you i'm just here to warn you and alert you that what has happened before can very well happen again the idea is is this is that you're not the only one that's going through turn to the person on the right and say hello That person has either finished going, just finished going through something, they're currently going through something, or they're being prepared to go through something real soon. Make sense? Turn to the person on the left and say, good morning. That person is the same way. Either they have just come out of something, they are currently going through something, or they are being prepared for the fire just about to go in. So you're not the only one that's going through. Remember I said it is self-deception to think that you're the only one that is doing God's will? 
Well, it's the devil's deception to make you think that you're the only one that's going through. The Bible says that in the, we're going to experience trouble, right? I don't care what televangelist told you that if you have sickness or if you have trouble that there is sin. No, no, no. You don't have to sin. Right. You don't have to sin and you're still going to experience what we call trouble. Right. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what kind of connections you have. Your trouble might not be my trouble. My trouble might not be your trouble. But no matter what, it falls under the banner of trouble. You're not the only one going through. Don't play the victim when you're the victor. Victims say it's all about me. Look at me. Look at my wounds. Look at what they did. Look at what I'm going through. The victor says, look at my scars and look how I overcome. That's what the victor says. So we have a choice to either play the victor or the victim. A victor is what we're supposed to be. A victim is leaving beneath our privilege. My last point, and I told you I wouldn't be before you long. Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Verse 71. We're not the only ones that are doing God's will. We're not the only ones that is going through. And, 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 and just going back to going through for a second, there's always a reason to quit. Always. Matter, as a matter of fact, there are probably a thousand times more reasons to quit than to continue. Right? Always. You know what? No matter what you do, you get up in the morning, you get ready to go to work, and you're saying, yo, it's raining outside, I don't feel like going. It's sunny outside, it's a good day, I don't feel like going. <sighs> the cat is meowing too much, I don't feel like going. It's a ah! You get up to go to church in the morning, you know what, 7.30? Yeah, we'll be out by 10, but it's too early in the morning, I don't feel like going. There's Ustream. <sighs> I can say I went. Ustream is for the sick and shut in. It's not for the I don't want to come. It's not made for that. Right? It's for the sick and, excuse me, it's for the sick and shut in and those that are working on Sunday. It's not for the, I just don't want to come. It's a waste of my time. I'll, I'll get enough. Because there's some stuff that you can't experience on TV. You actually have to be here. Right? Think about this for a second. On a hot day, on a cold day, right? On a very, very cold day, you could watch a television program of a fire. Right? It's not going to make you warm. You don't really get warm until you get around some fire, right? It's the, same thing with, it's the same thing with TV. Same thing with church. You can only get so much from TV. Right? Oh, I felt the anointing. No, you felt the comfort of your sofa. I'm just being 100% real. And I'm not negating the man and woman of God. Yeah, and I'm not negating God's power. Yes, yes, we can sense the anointing of God through mediums like television and radio. Yes. But if you can walk... If you can move your limbs, you have time, right? Right? You can get to church. We don't hold, we not old school. We don't hold you four hours. We hold you like two and a half. And today we're going to hold you like two. <laughs> Psalms 119. Psalms 119. 119, verse 71. The Bible reads, it was good for me to be afflicted. Some powerful stuff. I'm almost scared to read this. It was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. The law from your mouth is more precious to me than thousands of pieces of silver and gold. Your hands made me and formed me. Give me understanding to learn your commands. Um, yeah. May those who fear you rejoice when they see me, for I have put my hope in your word. The psalmist says it was good for him to be afflicted. It was good for him to experience trouble, good for him to be humble, because it caused him, it caused him to learn more about God, to learn more about his word. And now the psalmist says, this affliction has made me an example. So you're not the only ones going through, excuse me, you're not the only ones that are doing God's will, you're not the only ones going through, and you're not the only one looking. There are people looking to see how well you go through. Because nobody wants a Jesus that doesn't work. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants a Jesus. Let me give you a case in point. If a 500-pound man came to you and told you, y'all can help you lose weight. Right. Right. 
It's the same way when you go to them and show them Jesus loves you and you all depressed and messed up. It's the same way. They're looking at you like, you better use them then. <laughs> he, he can't work for you. The same way you look at that 500 pound dude that told you he, he knows the secret to lose weight. I got the secret. I got the secret. Somebody said they must have kept the secret from him. <laughs> right? Here's the thing. That's what it is. Is what it is. <laughs> the, the idea is, is this. We can't be out in the streets talking about Jesus and we all depressed. We all nasty. You know, I told you some days I love people and I don't like them. But then some days I love them and, you know, and I like them. You can't have every day where you just love everybody and don't like nobody. Every day. Good morning. What's good about it? That's a lot of venom. And sometimes that happens right after church. You like in the, in the parking lot. You like wow. For those that are married in here, sometimes it happens in a car ride home. Shh, don't tell nobody. Shh, don't even look at her. Don't look at her. Don't look at him. Happens to didn't I tell you to come? Well, wasn't wasn't you just laid out on the ground at the church? The ushers had to pick you up. <laughs> And then you lay back out again <laughs> under the anointing. <laughs> Come on, people. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. You can't. We, and I'm not saying to be perfect because nobody's perfect. But I'm saying your good, like the song says, your good days should outweigh your bad days. It shouldn't be the other way around. Right? It shouldn't be. The, not if you say that you're walking, currently walking with Jesus. How? How? How is it that we are walking with the Savior and the evidence of his power does not reside on our lives? How is that possible? If I walk into a room where everybody's smoking a blunt, I'm going to come out smelling like weed. I don't got to stay there for about two seconds. And when I walk past somebody, they're going to be like, Brother Fred been smoking? What's wrong? He, he been smoking. You can't let him breathe no more because he been smoking. He's smoking. Will you smell him? Go. Walk by him. See what he says. The aroma from wherever I was for two seconds is on me. So how is it that we experience this Christ and two seconds later is as if we live like the devil? How is that possible? There are people watching you to see your family. Some of your family members aren't getting saved because you're not being a good example. You're supposed to, we are supposed to be an example of God's goodness and God's mercy and his power changing our lives. And we always got a bad attitude and didn't want to pray for you. No, don't, don't touch me. I have family members on my side of the family that they'll be like, I need to pray for you. No, 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 no. You need to get your life together. Don't touch me. Pray for me from distance. And not, again, not being perfect, but yo, let it work for you first. You know what I'm saying? Dude comes says, you know what? I lift a lot of weights, but he ain't got no muscles. <laughs> Get back to the gym, though. Excuse me. I'm sorry. Get back to the gym and do some work. Let me see it work for you. And then I can say, you know what? I saw what it did for him. Let me go try this. But we can't be the same person. We've been saved for 15 years. And we the same street type person that we were 15 years ago. We come around the same dudes from the block and the people from the block. Like, yo, what's going on, man? It's like old times. And nothing about you has changed. That's a problem. That speaks louder than any sermon could ever speak. So remember, there is, let me make sure I'm done. I'm just about done. Model. You're a model. So be a model. You're a model of God's goodness and grace. So be a model. Whatever that looks like for you, whatever that takes, be a model. Because what we're doing more, more than converting people, we're confusing them. Because we're saying one thing, and, we're, and then we're doing or seeing, and they're seeing something else, right? Christianity is just what it is. It is about Christ dying for us and transforming us as we walk with him, right? That's what it's about. That doesn't mean you be per you're perfect, but that means at some point, if I've known you for 15 years and you've always been the same, attitude, everything's been the same, there's something, and you walk with Jesus, there's something wrong. 
there has to be some kind of progression. Because if there's no progression, then that means there's a regression, right? You're either growing or you're dying. You're either progressing, moving forward, or you're falling back. One of the two. There is no, I'm just going to, what do they say in the army? What is it called? Mark time? Is that what it is? There, there is no marking time in life. That, doesn't, that only works in the military. That doesn't work in life. People are looking at us, how well we go through, how, how well we execute the will of God. Are we doing the will of God on our terms only? Are we doing the will of God the way God wants? They're looking because this world is dying. They're hurting. They need an answer. And many of them understand that the answer is Jesus, but they're just looking for a good representative. You ever heard about a company that was real good, but all the representatives that you ever encountered were terrible? It's kind of like what Muhammad Gandhi said about Christianity. He says, this Jesus you guys talk about? Wonderful. It's just his followers are just terrible. That's the same sentiment. That was like 40 years ago. It's the same sentiment in many cases today. We have a great, great product, great service, a great savior. Just, we just need to be better representations of the savior. And that comes with time. That comes with training. That comes with intentionality. We just have to be. Somebody say, I need, I need to be a better, be a better representative, representative for, Jesus. for Jesus. With that said, God bless you.